So regarding Ms. Clark, uh, as I've, uh, I believe I mentioned it a few weeks ago, I, um, I'm not here to call into question Ms. Clark's motives uh, or, or whether or not she's a good person. I'm willing to assume that her, her motives are good and that she's a good person. Uh, it's not my job as a, as a U.S. Senator and it's beyond uh, my ability to look into those other things. But I do have serious concerns about some things that I see in her record. Concerns that um, after I raise them, uh, have not been met with, uh, with a rebuttal, you know, certainly not with an adequate refutation. First, uh, given the importance of the division that she's been called to head and that uh, we're considering uh, having her lead, uh, I'm worried that there have been past instances in which she's publicly pushed the Department of Justice to not pursue egregious instances of intimidation. Um, for example, Ms. Clark criticized the Department of Justice decision to prosecute Ike Brown for voter intimidation and suppression. A reminder, in that case, uh, a Mississippi Democratic official engaged in rampant vote manipulation and absent, absentee ballot fraud uh, was the issue. Rather than praising the Justice Department's successful prosecution in that case, she criticized the decision to prosecute it, stating that some of the claims were, were quote unquote weak. Now, when asked point blank directly whether she agreed with the Department of Justice's decision to prosecute two members of the new Black Panther Party who showed up to a polling place wielding a billy club, she demurred, saying, quote, I believe the leadership of the Justice Department had the prerogative to bring the cases that it deemed appropriate to bring. It's a completely non-responsive answer. Uh, it's like saying that Congress has the prerogative to pass legislation, whatever legislation that it deems appropriate. In, in short, she was unwilling to decry what was outrageous and, in my view, clearly, patently unlawful and lawless voter suppression and intimidation when Democrats were implicated. She's shown no such hesitancy, however, in challenging common sense election security laws, like voter identification requirements passed by state legislatures. Indeed, she's frequently challenged state election laws, attempting to paint ballot security measures as, in and of themselves, racially discriminatory. Now, the, the, those are serious accusations one makes against a, a duly enacted law by duly elected lawmakers in a state when, where a state has clear authority to enact laws setting election policy. Which raises the question, does Ms. Clark oppose all voter intimidation or just voter intimidation against certain groups? When the position the nominee is applying is uh, one that involves being the head of the Civil Rights Division, it's not a question that you want to have to ask. Second, Ms. Clark has shown a troubling disregard towards certain constitutional rights. And a few years ago, she decried the Trump administration's creation of a religious liberty task force, saying that the goal was, quote, to make it easier for people to use religion to mask their discriminatory goals, and then she added the word shameful. I'd remind Ms. Clark that the very first sentence of the Bill of Rights safeguards the very religious freedoms that she accuses of making, of, of being there in order to make and mask discriminatory goals. And again, late last year, Ms. Clark attacked the Supreme Court's decision in Roman Catholic Diocese versus Cuomo, claiming that the court's ruling wrongly privileged religion's freedom, religious freedom above all else. Now, that decision, to put it in context, uh, did not do that. It simply stated that uh, there is this common sense proposition, and it stated the proposition that, that government must treat mosques and synagogues and churches 
the same way that it treats liquor stores and acupuncture, uh, acupuncture clinics. In other words, if you're going to allow a liquor store and an acupuncture clinic to go under one standard, you can't impose a different, more restrictive standard on houses of worship simply because they are religious institutions. That the Constitution plainly prohibits. So it's, it's statements like these that give religious Americans, like myself, pause. It should give all Americans, whether they're religious or not, pause. Why should we believe that she'll defend the civil rights, including the religious rights of all Americans, and not just the ones with which she happens to agree? Finally, I'm worried that Ms. Clark's failure adequately to address her troubling history uh, 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 of irresponsible activism sends us a, an, another concerning signal. In college, she wrote an article stating that, quote, melanin endows blacks with greater mental, physical, and spiritual abilities, something which cannot be measured based on Eurocentric standards, close quote. Now, when, when asked about this, it, at the hearing in various ways, in various formulations, through various members of this committee. She claimed that this was meant to be satirical, but at no point, either at the hearing or in follow-up questions for the record or otherwise, did she ever acknowledge the obvious, that these statements were unacceptable, regardless of whether she intended them to be satirical. Likewise, rather than express regret, for her decision to participate and assist in a conference defending cop killers and domestic terrorists in law school, she merely said, I provided logistical support. This contradicts statements made by numerous speakers at the conference who personally thanked her for her efforts. None of this is unforgivable, of course. We, we, we've, we've all said and done things that we later come to regret. But Ms. Clark, it's notable here, is, is asking us to apply a different standard to her than we've applied to others. In 2019, her name appeared on a letter sent by the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, where she sat on the board of directors opposing the nomination of Ryan Bounds. The letter stated that, quote, while Bounds recently apologized for those comments, the timing of that apology suggests it is one of convenience rather than remorse, offered in a last-ditch effort to salvage his nomination, close quote. Now, in her hearing testimony, she provided no explanation for why we should overlook her extraordinarily controversial statements and activities while she was a student. Rather, she attempted to minimize and evade her actions. We even asked her specifically uh, about that comparison. And there again, there was no effort to reconcile the two or explain how they were different or to differentiate this set of circumstances from those. And Ms. Clark's history of, of actions and words that are troubling, unfortunately, didn't end with law school. In 2019, she signed a letter defending Tamika Mallory, a woman who stated that, quote, white Jews uphold white supremacy, close quote, and, and associated herself with Louis Farrakhan. When pressed on this statement, uh, she, she gave no explanation for her statement of support, other than by saying that the letter denounced anti-Semitism. I'm confused. H how exactly is it that, that a letter defending a woman accused of making anti-Semitic statements could actually be a letter denouncing anti-Semitism. I, I don't see it. E either anti-Semitism is bad or it's not. I, you can't eat your cake and, and have it too. And likewise, just last year, Ms. Clark wrote an article titled, I Prosecuted Police Killings, Defund the Police, But Be Strategic. That is the actual title in direct quotes. When, now, when pressed about this by members of this committee. Ms. Clark, once again, sought to evade responsibility, stating that she has, quote, developed a practice of being deferential to editors on title selection, close quote. 
I'm not sure how this, that's how this works. I don't think that's how taking responsibility for that works. The article did, in fact, have her name on it. Notably, I, I found it significant that she didn't say she was, she had no choice in it, that she was utterly unaware of it, but rather that she showed deference. I'm not sure exactly what she means by this. But, and you can hardly blame the editor for the title that he or she chose, if in fact he or she chose the title. Ms. Clark wrote three times in the piece, in this article, quote, we must invest less in police, close quote. So in short, Ms. Clark's record reflects a consistent pattern of troubling statements and actions, followed by a disclaimer of responsibility and a lack of remorse. Moreover, her record gives reason to doubt that she'll defend the civil rights of all Americans and not just those she perceives to be her allies. And for these reasons, I can't support her nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Lee. Any other members wishing to seek recognition on the nominations?